Thank you. Yeah. So um, we have a lot of serious ground to cover now. I hope you don't mind. But um, I did want to start with the rather intriguing statistic that you offered us that 13 ambassadors of your country to the US later became the president. Yes. And since you've served here twice, I wonder if that doubles your chances. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I try once and fail. Okay. <laughs> so let's see if it works in the future. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but on a, on a slightly more serious note, since both TRAC and the Center for Security Policy Studies really think about you know, how to make the world a less dangerous place, how do we manage some of the challenges that confront our, our respective countries, I hoped that we could hear a little bit more from your both immediate experience but also representing your country, how we Americans should think about the status of Plan Colombia today. I mean, I think from an American perspective, it was considered a success. I was working on Capitol Hill for some of that time. And one of the debates that I think captures a little bit the, the dilemma of how to think about it, was a success or not, was when Congress couldn't decide whether the funding was counter-narcotics funding or counter-insurgency funding. So you had two kind of competing conceptual frameworks to think about what's the underlying problem that we're trying to address here. You could argue from a US interest perspective that it was that drugs was the driver of our interest in Colombia, but for Colombia, maybe it was seen very differently. So help us understand both the political and the illicit drug parts of that story um, during the implementation of the plan and how you look at it today. If you if we could start there. Well, for, first I'm going to be making a very clear statement. It's a great policy. It has been extremely useful for Colombia. Without Plan Colombia, we wouldn't have this. As simple as it is. Now, why? First, Plan Colombia was not a unique kind of policy program. It was, frankly speaking, a very broad policy set of activities. And it included a military security site, a social development effort, mm -hmm. and at the same time, an institutional development capacity. These three things worked together, you know, and that's why we somehow had progress on different areas of uh, Colombia. Now, numbers, by the year 2000, when the early stage of Plan Colombia began, our uh, poverty was 54%. Mm. By year 2019, and I'd like to stop there and let's move forward after before COVID, we moved to 27%. So Colombia was the country in the whole Latin American region that first economically grew faster than any other in these 20 years due to the progress in security and second, that cut poverty faster than any other. And somehow that dynamism was coming. In addition to that, the conditions to negotiation <coughs> were created as consequence of Plan Colombia. Now, when you had the dilemma about counter-narcotics versus counter-insurgency, of course, as you can imagine, I was being a critic of those who were having that dilemma in Colombia, because to us it was very clear. Without narcotics, there will be no insurgency mm. as we knew it. And let me explain why. The insurgency that Colombia had was created in the 60s as the insurgency of any other country uh, that was in the competition or in the struggle during Cold War. It happened in El Salvador, it happened in Guatemala, in Peru, in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Venezuela, about Latin America, not to forget East Asian countries and African countries. When the Berlin Wall fell, the last guerrilla that was con able to continue to exist in Latin America was Colombia. Mm. And why was that? Because they, not, they were not needing any kind of funding coming from any uh, regional or global power. They were fully self-funded with drug yes. money. And by the way, they even were investing in NGOs in countries, especially in uh, Northern Europe, as evidence we found a long time. So uh, I like to, to, to remind this mm. because th that was a kind of challenge uh, uh, we confronted, but at the same time, that was the policy response. Now, I guess we're going to speak later about the, the 
uh, Havana agreements of 2016. Because our trend was like this, and since that moment, some things have happened that we need to understand and figure out. And some are trying to blame Plan Colombia for the failures that were not related to Plan Colombia, which includes later, why cocaine pick up again? It was not because Plan Colombia failed. It was because we stopped doing what we were doing. Mm. And that was a delivered policy for a good intention, maybe, but a failed policy. And I think that's a little bit of what I think is important to, to come in. I don't know if I respond to your question, fine, but yeah. I try to, you know, touch base a little bit on, on everything you, you Yeah, have. so I'd like to uh, build up on that. So um, most people, most people in the U.S., and I would say most people around the world, see the agreement as the peace agreement, as the successful yeah. culmination of a process that started in the early 2000s with Plan Colombia, right? And that, as you mentioned, forced uh, FARC to negotiate and then to demobilize. Mm -hmm. uh, so from, 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 the, from abroad, from outside, it seems like a success story. It seems like a very pleasant story. Uh, but within the country, we've seen um, that national reconciliation has proven more difficult than anticipated. And uh, a lot of polarization has uh, emerged from the agreements. And I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on that. So part of my career was trying to bring peace to Colombia. The only reason why we led the fight against terrorism was with one clear single intention, making Colombia a peaceful country, giving those child that we show a better future and creating these Colombia that can thrive and move us to the future. The good news is the sacrifice of our military and our police and our people was so important that somehow we achieved a lot of that. But my frank opinion is that we didn't conclude it as we must. Let me explain. I personally was one of the ones who promoted the idea of negotiating from strength. You know, because we try a negotiation, if you remember, in the year 1998. Mm. By the way, we're, we're, we're negotiating and making peace agreements is, is kind of a sport in Colombia. It's a political sport, you know. It sounds a little bit uh, uh, lack of uh, seriousness, but it's true. You know, every 10 years for the past 40, we have signed some kind of agreement with the M19, with the EPL, with Quintin Lame, with uh, uh, CRS, with the AUC, later with the FARC. Somehow it's something we do. And still we haven't made agreements with ELN and with the remnants of the FARC that are still around. So I like to say this because, you know, especially in an academic world, because you need to see events not as politicians as we do, that we just care for the next election and how do I look in the, in the polls, but as nations. How does it look in history, and how will it look to the future? The problem with that agreement was that negotiation conditions were created, but the quality of the negotiation was really poor, in my opinion. And it had two reasons. Number one, because the government showed extreme will to sign, and the other side saw it. Mm -hmm. So when you are negotiating, as a matter of expertise, and the other side see you willing to, you know, give away what you have, they take the chance, and they did it. That's point number one. Number two, unfortunately, and this is something that I bring to any democracy, including of this country, that I care very much. I do care for the U.S. a lot. When I see that political divide, the only people who benefit of the political divide are the enemies of all. And somehow that political divide was happening in Colombia. And also the other side saw it. So they saw eagerness to give, and on the other side, a very important divide. So they move in the middle, and they took advantage of that. That is so clear that when the agreement was signed, it was taken to the polls. It was a, a referendum, a plebiscite. And Colombians voted against. There's people that has come to me and ask how Colombians vote against peace. No, 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 they never vote against peace. We, all of us are for peace. We, the only thing that we want to see is peace. 
what we didn't want it was to see excessive benefits for war criminals mm. other than Colombian people, rather than Colombian people. So those who victimize got better position than their victims. And half of Colombian people, a little bit more than that, came to that conclusion and they opposed. Then the agreement was forced again in Congress with some pork barrel politics and then in the courts. The consequence is we have an agreement and we have to comply with it. Mm -hmm. But already the, 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 you know, the, the, the environment about it is, is about a divide and there's confrontation. Now, conclusions about the agreement that I believe, if you ask me even how I do see the future, I don't see it going back to the past or getting rid of what we have. But as you know, someone that needs to think more about the future than to the past, I am clear that we need to enhance or correct what is wrong instead of fighting. What is not right right now? First, we stop the way we were confronting the, the, the problem of drugs in Colombia. The problem of cocaine was basically confronted by different tools, including several among those spraying. We stopped doing that, and somehow we have today five times more cocaine than what we had at the end of the, of the, of the, of the, of the peace agreement. So the question is, was it worth it? Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, yes, but it is, we're paying a price for it. Second, we weakened the security forces for a while. And when President Duque wanted to recover that, COVID hit. And who will spend money in security when your priority was to spend money in ICUs? So he had to hold it. And frankly speaking, there were no resources to do more. And thirdly, the idea of impunity. That it really hurts a lot of people in Colombia. The fact of, I'm going to give you just a, a story of two weeks ago. There's a member of Congress in Colombia that was kidnapped being a boy of 18 year old, exchanged for his father, and stayed as hostage for six years. Last election he was elected. This time he only got like 40,000 votes, so he fall, fell short for 2,000 votes. The individuals that led his kidnapping are members of Congress for free with no votes. So that's when I came to see even people from different ideological perspectives and said, that's not fair. And fairness is not about ideology. Fairness is about same rules for everybody. And that's where I think we need to correct this because otherwise the great achievements that have allowed Colombia to move to East Colombia might have some risk. And now it has empowered some people even to think that they don't need to be prosecuted about anything, that they can do bad things, and that they can really even take the government of Colombia, which we have to respect people's will, mm -hmm. but we need to explain to people this kind of conversation. So, so, you, yes. so you mentioned, um, you know, in theory, the FARC has been dismantled. They do have this political acceptance now, though that's not shared by everybody. But you mentioned territory. Are there really parts of the country that are not under the control of the government? I think we have lost part of the territorial control we achieved. Hmm. And I'm just going to give you a number. When I was Minister of Defense, I was very fortunate to have the, 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 the largest ever military and policing in the history of Colombia and the best equipped ever due to Colombian taxpayers and also to Plan Colombia. And I like to say this because many people think that it's, it's just Plan Colombia. No, 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 it's Colombian taxpayer that paid a wealth tax that allowed us to get funded. At the time, I had 470,000 men and women in arms. Today, we have around 390,000. Those 80,000 that are, we are missing are the ones that were very important to be used today to control those territories that were in the hands of these organizations, even providing to the people solutions and protecting communities, social leaders among others, and definitely protecting the cities. As we lost that, we are again overstretched. 
and that's where I see mm. some level of challenge that uh, you 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 mm -hmm. you kind of figure out. I for for all of us who work on security issues, um, having you here um, as you know twice the ambassador here, Minister of Defense, Vice Minister of Defense. Um, it's great because um, we've been analyzing issues like drug trafficking in Colombia, terrorism, FARC, for a long, long time. And I, I would not um, forgive myself if I don't ask you this, this, um, this question. It's like, Colombia is having uh, presidential elections this year. And most, if not all, candidates have... Um, um, are running on a platform, are running on platforms that contemplate drastic shifts to the counter narcotics strategy, right? In essence, um, most, again, if not all, um, candidates are running on a platform that states that they will end the drug, the war on drugs, right? And this comes after 60 years of, of the war being declared. How do you see the future of counter-narcotics um, policy? Well, a few things. I, my personal take on this is that we should not fight drugs. We should fight terrorists or criminals or those who are tempting against the rights of the people. And fighting drugs is fighting the source of income for them. But we should not fight drugs per se. We should fight the organization, the terrorist structure. So if that kind of policy releases the funding, good news. But if it doesn't, they're going to be making a huge mistake. Uh, of course, it comes a little bit from my own background. And, and as much as I study about security, warfare, and, and I even have to lead my own, I really clear will be telling everybody that when you're confronting a challenge, don't look around, focus on the real problem. So the real problem for us is that now. There are many ways to, to confront that. On one hand, yes, Colombia needs to continue to evolve into a more equitable society and a better uh, uh, country for opportunities, especially for the youngsters. We need to do that. And that's something that we need to, to keep doing. On the other side, we need to continue to uh, confront through rule of law those who are uh, atten attempting to, to, to the people. Now, I, I kind of say already, if that policy brings even stronger organizations, it will be a real failure. So how you make sure you, 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 you don't get that? And here's where I bring my own view on this. And I like to speak to a community like this one here in the United States, and I've been doing this in different schools all along the year. Please stop consumption. <laughs> That's the real thing for us. Stop consumption. Is consumption what is a problem to us? You know, we can do local policies there. It will not get solved until someone decides here that you will not get that consumption. I'm very much educated into free, into individual freedoms. And I strongly believe and defend those. That's part of our democratic values. So I'm not anyone to tell anybody, don't do this or do that. But I think we, as governments, should come back and re-educate people about the harm that that represents. Mm -hmm. And we should advertise how bad it is for people, as we do today with tobacco or with alcohol. You know. We need to let people figure out that you should not do that and remove them. And by the way, one thing that I'd like to, rem to remind our, 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 our friends is that the wars about cocaine, if we put it in climate change terms, is the destruction of the tropical forests and the contamination of the rivers mm. in Colombia. Mm. It's dramatic what happens out of that. So for youngsters, that I've seen some of them, well, I don't want to have any more meat. I respect that. It's their decision. I respect individual rights. Why? Ah, because that destroys uh, or contributes to climate change. I understand. Respect. But why don't you stop consuming that same person cocaine? Because that cocaine destructs a lot more 
than the cattle you don't want to eat for a good reason. I respect mm -hmm. that. And I think and I hope that institutions like yours can help us to frame that conversation. So I leave you with two ideas. I think we need to focus not on the drug trade per se, but on the criminal organizations and disrupting their drug trade and their drug benefits. Let's find policies that can do that. But second is about consumption. Let's move into the consumption dialogue the so demand we can side. Yeah. You know, stop that out in a way. Yeah. You know what is the bad news that I've seen now? Because we have a skyrocketed cocaine production that now we have more consumers in Colombia than mm -hmm. ever before. Mm -hmm. And that worries me because then it also brings uh, social harm. Social harm, yeah. Right? We've seen that in other parts of the world, in Afghanistan. Right? It was an export Absolutely. market, but it also became a domestic market. I want to encourage anybody who has a question to start to come to the microphones. And um, maybe I could pose one more question, and then uh, our, our time is a little bit short. So let's go a little bit beyond your borders. Um, you know, we see sometimes mood shifts in Latin America, complicated attitudes towards the United States. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on whether young people in Colombia or in more official channels as well uh, look to try to balance the great powers. If we think that we're living in a world of shifting geopolitics where the United States, U.S. primacy is no longer the necessarily the, the dominant story. Um, what about Russia or China's role in Latin America? Are you worried or see opportunities? How, how does Colombia look at um, the, the rise of the other great powers? Well, yeah. first, we're living, as you well said, in, the, in a new era of uh, global power competition, which is not so good as compared to what we had. You know, when you look 10, 15 years ago, it's kind of, now we're missing those times. You know, it was a better time in which at least there were a more clearer world order. That is that we don't have, and probably we will not have ever again. Hmm. Not the one we knew. Maybe a new one, but not the one we knew. Second, about the other extra-regional powers, what they are doing in the region. Russia is very harmful because they are not really helping any economic endeavor or any progress for the region other than selling weapons and installing in their uh, client uh, countries uh, intelligence and cyber capabilities. Mm -hmm. That is what is going on in the Maduro's Venezuela regime, in Ortega's Nicaragua, and somehow in Cuba uh, in a different way. I'm more worried now about uh, Ortega and Maduro. Uh, Iran is another player that is around. Hmm. You know, and they like to come to the region and they have made presence in the same countries with somehow intentions of, uh, you know, working with them and probably annoying the interests of the United States in the hemisphere. China is a different story, you know. China looks to me very much like the United States in the 1920s, mm. all right, which implies they have business opportunities and their intention of influence is not for next year or for the next government. It's for a real long-term uh, power achievement, which has a positive and a challenge. The positive, well, technology, business, investment, you know, money that allows our countries or our country to move forward. The challenge, if that influence will come to the future with pressure against democracy or promoting uh, governments that are not democratic and, and, and sharing the same values that we have. If that is so, that is worrisome. Mm -hmm. So we need to watch and balance that. Now, it's easy to say this being Colombia, because at the end, we have been the country that has advanced more in democracy in the region, the country that continues to stay strong in the side of democracy, even in world crisis, uh, about Ukraine. Uh, uh, out of the five major countries in Latin America, Colombia is the only one that has really made a strong statement against Putin himself and in favor of the, Ukraine, the, the people of Ukraine. And that's something that we really uh, are strong about. But when you go and see the others, they have not. So people is already trying to balance their position, where to play. And I think it's something that 
we need to figure out. But in summary, I guess that uh, it's important also to understand that uh, those who are not the friends that you have, not because you pamper them, will become your friends. And that somehow to me is a quote unquote critique to my friends in the United States. Sometimes you have a friend, but then you decide to pamper your opponent. And you think that by pampering your opponent, you're gonna make him a good friend, and you leave aside some of your friends. My opinion to this is it's very important to keep strengthening friendships and somehow handling adversaries, not confronting, but focusing on the friends. Hmm. Top, right? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Hi, Ambassador. Thank you for visiting George Mason. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a U.S. delegation that went to Venezuela for energy talks. I wonder uh, what you think about those talks? What's your assessment of those talks? Thank you. Well, a few days later, we had that wonderful meeting between our presidents, President Biden and, and President Duque. First, I think we need to understand the United States position right now, which implies that this is not about only a, a country or region, but it's a global challenge that we have coming out of the war, implying the need of more energy, more fertilizers, and more food. Or at least these three things are at risk, in a way. So any solution that comes, in my opinion, these days uh, from the efforts that President Biden is intending is precisely trying to to craft a policy around that. Now, it was very good for us to see him on time, I would say, because it was a good opportunity for uh, advising uh, the White House in terms of reminding first uh, who is Maduro and what he has done. You know, the record of human rights violation. Being him the closest ally of Putin makes something that needs to be watched in the sense that it doesn't make sense to confront one side of the problem, but then uh, feed the other side of the, of the same problem. So that's something we came with. And also we explained that unfortunately for Venezuelans, because remember Colombia and Venezuela are the same nation. <coughs> we came to life the same day with the same father. We are Siamese brothers forever. Mm -hmm. So we care for Venezuelans. Unfortunately for them, uh, the destruction of wealth and capital that has happened in Venezuela impedes that the country that has the mayor oil reserves in the world can take it out on time. So even if there's an investment of, of billions of dollars in, in Venezuela, to get the oil out will take four to five years. So first, where is the money that will bring that out? And second, uh, do the world have four or five years to contain the challenges that we're having. And that's where we said even countries like Colombia can increase faster some of the production that is required or either in the United States uh, so the United States can provide to Europe and then Europe doesn't have to buy from, from, from Russia. But you know, that's the kind of right. game and, and play that is being uh, happening all around. Yeah. I think we have um, time for one. Last question, uh, and I think it brings together most of the issues that we've discussed today. Um, so drug trafficking, uh, Venezuela, Russia, control of territory, um, and is the issue of, of corruption. Um, so the international media has covered recent scandals uh, involving high-ranked officials of the military, uh, of the Colombian military, right? Going from illegal telephone tapping and the payment of bribes in procurement process to being include, included in the monthly payroll of drug trafficking organizations. Um, so this, along with the effects that this will ha necessarily has on, um, on the rule of law and democracy, it poses, I would say, serious challenges on the capacity and the efficacy of the defense sector in the country to uh, respond to all of these criminal challenges that it <coughs> faces. And I, I'm wondering if 
um, you think, so how serious do you think this issue is uh, in the Colombia defense sector and how do you think uh, future governments and us Colombian relations could uh, work together to address the issue? Well, for, first, Camilo, uh, <laughs> as long as there are criminal economies flourishing from narcotics or from illegal gold mining, there's a risk. And that's a long history for Colombia, as you will know. It's very sad to know that in, his, in our history, different cartels, different criminal groups have somehow corrupted even governments. We cannot forget that in 1994, Colombia elected a government with Cali cartel money. So, I mean, the, 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 the fact of our history is there. And if, and if the criminal economies come back, the challenges for the institutions in Colombia become higher. Now, how to confront this? Justice, rule of law, and very important, counterintelligence. Something that worked very well for me on my time, where somehow I have cases, but it was not a daily scandal as, as I see can happen again, it was mainly a very strong connection with the US Embassy and other agencies, including the FBI, the DEA, and even the CIA, seeking for counterintelligence solutions and really uh, you know, working to provide a, a lot of probity in especially those units that are dedicated to the main targets mm -hmm. or the most important operations for counter-narcotics or for anti-corruption. But that continues to be a challenge in Latin America. Also, it's related to justice, uh, Camilo. I think that uh, in the years to come, not only in Colombia, but in Latin America as a whole, one of the main challenges is to work hard to make sure that justice becomes more effective. The level of impunity in Latin America is too high. In Colombia, impunity is for crimes against humanity, for corruption, uh, as I mentioned the case of uh, uh, that government some years ago, and in many other cases. So we need to reduce that. We need to create cases that prove effectiveness in the rule of law so we can deter those issues, but at the same time, keep fighting and defeating the sources of those uh, crimes. But uh, it's challenging. I, I cannot say it's, it's easy and it's part of what we need to work in the years to come. I think we have one question. Uh, thanks, Commander. Uh, thanks, Mr. Ambassador. My question is about FARC dissidents. Uh, last year, U.S. removed FARC from its terrorist organization list but added two more FARC dissidents, Seregundo Martiki and the FARC EP. So who are these dissident groups? Are they cocaine groups or are they terrorist organizations? Also, can you see these groups in the region as a big threat in the future? Thank you. I don't know if I got all your question, but uh, I, I hear FARC, FARC dissidents and the Mar Segunda Marquetalia and FARC EP. Few things. On my time as Minister of Defense, one of the things that we knew as part of the peace process that was moving forward was that the FARC wanted to keep some level of uh, remnants not to describe or to say uh, some level of rear guard. And what I believe is that they did that effectively and they did it for two purposes. Number one, to keep some access and control of the drug money that is really useful when you move into politics and other activities. I think that was the intention. And number two, because they thought that probably having some friends in the other side could be useful in case of necessary or of need for them. About that, my opinion is that six years after that it started like that, but now we have a more complex scenario. Some of them really became dissidents by betraying the organization and just trying to handle uh, drug money or gold money for their own interests and, and convenience. Some others are related to what was the old FARC, 
and some others are against those who signed the agreement and really want to have a new FARC. But the truth is that all this is connected. And I think we lost a little bit of time, and in my opinion, I need to be critic to some of my successors, because unfortunately they thought that uh, there was a, look, a lot of goodwill. Uh, and I criticize them for not understanding that when you're confronting threats, goodwill is very important for heart and for commitment and for doing the right thing, but about risks, you can never underestimate anyone. And you will always need to be prepared to confront the challenges that might come sooner or later. Well, on that very sober but very responsible uh, note, I think we can uh, wrap up our conversation tonight with, with really tremendous thanks to you and your team at the embassy for allowing us to have such a frank and enriching conversation with you. I think we all feel that we really benefited a lot, and um, both for the joyful, colorful uh, <laughs> realities of Colombia, but also some of these really challenges. enduring security challenges that I think we all are so in interested in, both academically and, and culturally and personally. So we r really want to thank you. I just want to say thanks to all the folks at TRAC who really did all of the logistics and organizational pieces to pull this event together. And uh, thanks to the audience for coming, but mostly thanks to you, Mr. Ambassador. Wonderful no, conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm really thankful to you, to, to the George Mason University, to all of you for being here, to you, and especially to you, Camilo, for bringing me in. Thank you for that. And I will leave you with one final note. Probably this is the time I've been more open about recent history in Colombia. I have to tell you, for a long time, you, you have to say things in the best possible uh, language. But I decided today to come here and really be very specific on how I see the country, where are the challenges, and where are the flaws, with one real intention, not looking more to the past, but trying to correct whatever we need to the future. And that's the way I feel. Well, that's Thank a you. great message for a public policy school. We really <laughs> appreciate it. We all want to work on these problems together. Thank you so much.